Mark Gates uh, talking about trees and stuff. OK, thanks, Ross. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, there will be a bit of chat about trees, that's right. Uh, well, thank you for the opportunity to talk about a little bit of the work we do in forest research uh, on open source software and decision support tools. So uh, the outline of this talk is a little bit about the history of uh, the theme for today, which is the selection of tree species for, for forests in the UK, uh, and look at some of the decision support systems we use in forestry uh, with relation to ecological site classification. We'll show you where we've got to so far with our developments for a new version which has some spatial capabilities, and then we'll maybe take some questions at the end. So um, this is what spatial decision support systems looked like in the 1950s for forestry. Uh, there would be books with bioclimatic regions which would constrain your species somewhat. Uh, you would get a prescription for the particular species and management types you could deploy in these different areas. Um, now, that was fine, and then in the 60s and 70s, a new concept was uh, developed where instead of matching the tree species that you wanted to plant to the site conditions, um, you turned it the other way around. So you matched the site to what the, the requirements might be for a given tree. So with, uh, with extensive ploughing and fertiliser, the afforestation of, in Britain in the 60s and 70s allowed us to conquer a lot of sites. That was fine until the 80s and 90s when sustainable forest management became key and in conjunction with increased costs led to a reduction in fertiliser use and, and, and in addition to that objectives moved away from production forestry. Skills and staff were lost and the land available for afforestation was often degraded in poor quality. With all this the information a forester might have to consider with a range of site types, the tree species, and potentially future climatic conditions, what we needed were uh, digital data and, and computer processing to assist them in making their decisions about their future forests. So that led to the development uh, at the end of the 1990s of uh, ecological site classification. Um, this included a computer-based decision support system, a field survey pack, uh, at the time, for our own internal use, we had a spatial arc view extension for consultancy work. And, and the concepts from ESC, at least, have been quite heavily embedded within British forestry, I think it's fair to say. So in, in terms of decision support systems, as I'm talking about them today, um, I refer to them as tools that help simplify a complex problem so you can evaluate the relative merits of different management actions. Something my colleagues are very keen that I always emphasise is that they're intended to complement and not replace the expert, expert or local knowledge that a forester, for example, might have. They're very vulnerable to being uh, used with poor quality data, in which case you get poor quality information out. And also, in fairness, it's not just the users that might cause problems, it's the models themselves, because there's an awful lot of uncertainty and error and assumptions within the models that we've developed. So in the context of, for instance, ecological site classification, the aim of the decision support tool is to query a site for some properties based on a grid reference or some sort of spatial reference, analyze them with a scientific model, return the results to the user. For practical terms, we usually find that um, 250 meter by 250 meter pixels works well for the raster data covering the climate and soil data that we use. Um, we do have some models that are a little bit more complicated, which have spatial interactions within the environment, such as insects moving according to their preferences for different site types. The audience for all this is quite broad. We've got education, use in universities and forestry courses, researchers, private sector forestry, and the public sector, of course. So we've gone a web-based route because that helps us meet uh, everyone's uh, needs, basically, in the simplest way. Okay, uh, jumping on to ecological site classification, if you were asked to look at this particular site and choose tree species for it, how would you do that? Well, in, in this case, actually, nature's helped because it's already made the decision because you can see some young trees regenerating there. If they weren't there, what we would, we would suggest is you look at four climatic factors and two soil factors. Now, we have the climatic factors calculated at GB scale, um, but the soil factors, well, really, we need um, a soil survey to 
uh, inform the decision support system there because there's so much variability ac across the landscape. To illustrate some of the topographic effects on planting, this is our garden forest on the west coast. You can see there's quite a hard edge there uh, where the tree line stops quite abruptly. Well, this is related to exposure constraints in this area. So um, you can see we use this metaphor as red is bad, green is good. You can see in the more lying areas it's quite sheltered, but as you go up the slope it becomes progressively more exposed. So we presume at some point a forester uh, cut the line uh, and didn't want to take any further risks with uh, wind throw or other effects that might develop higher up. So in essence, that's the model we're talking about today. We've got the four climatic, two soil factors, the climatic factors, I should have said, encapsulate warmth, rainfall, and exposure. We feed into a species model, and we get a growth rate, which is called yield class, and an ecological suitability index. So you can imagine we've got all those raster maps for the climate and soil factors, for instance. So we'll have about six of them. And then this is the output you would get for a given species. Uh, that's pedunculate oak. And you can see, again, with the uh, green is good, red is bad metaphor, that traffic light system, we can see there's some areas in this particular region where you wouldn't want to plant pedunculate oak marked in red. OK, so the guiding principles when we're developing a lot of this is we don't want to impose our technical requirements on the end users. Historically, we've uh, developed some tools that were Windows only, desktop tools, for example. And we also wanted to ensure the interoperability of the geospatial data and the services across different platforms. So in the latest developments in ESC, we're trying to use web map services, GeoJSON, uh, and various other open data formats. Uh, this is how the old system looked. It was stand-based. That means we just looked at one site. You put in a grid reference and you got some results. And you could play about with the soil attributes, for example. Moving forward, um, we should have said that Forestry Commission is part of, uh, has a number of component parts of which forest research is one. Historically, we worked with uh, their technology stack which was a spatial largely in terms of its public-facing public infrastructure. But we've moved more recently towards an open-source GI stack where we've replaced Oracle Application Server and Oracle Database with open-source equivalents, and that saved us a lot of money in licensing and so on. Um, I'll skip over this slide because it just basically outlines how various parts of the... Um, open source tools fit together. So what does it look like? Well, we've got our, still got our stand level decision support system. Users can enter some data and access it. Uh, it's, it's basically HTML uh, with some JSON used to exchange information between the client and the server. Uh, if people are using desktop GIS, they can interact with the climatic data and other information via the desktop with web map services. And that's helped a lot in contextualizing some of this information and moving away from that point-based approach. So there are three principal use cases for ESC. There's the site scale, which I've just mentioned, where you can pretty much point and click. Um, there's a strategic scale, which was answered with the web map services. But there's also an in-between use case, which is the operational scale, when you've got a forest design plan area with many sites. And this is where we're, we're still exploring things, and we're open to some ideas about how this could be improved. At the moment, our proposal is to handle this by uploading the uh, soil survey for your design plan area, and then we'll process it online and send back the data as GeoJSON. So that's the new version, so you can see we've got stand-level information, but you can view it in the context of uh, the spatial data, so you can look at some variation in the landscape. So that's looking at uh, the site with reference to the local modelled soil properties, so we can see that there's some drier areas in that region, for example, and you might want to be careful about planting drought-sensitive species. But this is really where the interest lies, and, that, and applying it 
at a landscape scale, as I said. So this is a forest design plan area with a soil map. Forgive me, these are all just little codes, but to foresters, they would probably mean something. And they would like to be able to translate this on a, a click on the button type procedure to an answer as to how good is that area for a given species or set of species. So what we have to do is we have to process all that data. We've got various approaches that I've outlined there where we use... Uh, for instance, we use geotools to query the rasters for the climatic data at the moment. We've been experimenting trying to use rasters in post-GIS, which we've not found as quick at the moment, but maybe there's some optimizations we can do there. But the end goal is this. Uh, so we've got this working, as I say, but what you've got there is um, an analysis of that area for a design plan that was entirely Sitka spruce. So we can see that at the top left, we've got some areas where it's very green and there's high numbers. That means there's a high growth rate and the species is very ecologically suited. Along the top there, where there was bare rock, there's not such a good uh, opportunity for that given species. Now, we can, once you've got this information, you can do some things with it in um, QGIS. We've been inspired by a lot of the work we've seen here, for instance, with the 3D visualisation. So you can overlay your suitability maps, for instance. Here we've got silver birch at Loch Ard, and it's looking pretty much OK everywhere. Douglas fir west, so, so for a design planner, those are quite useful pieces of information to have that can help them target the species in the best possible areas. Uh, and then uh, just another example showing what we can do as we extend this into windrush. You can see we're following that red is bad metaphor uh, along the ridges on the eastern side of that valley. There's some wind exposure problems compared to the west side. Um, so as I say, it's a bit of a work in progress. Um, we've got a lot of revision to do to user interface in conjunction with the user groups involved. Um, we've got some optimization to look at, and we've got to try and look at the, the issue of how we get survey data directly loaded into the system so that people don't have to do too much manipulation of the data within GI themselves. Um, and that's it. Thank you. Oh, hi. Hi there. Um, with the ESC data, you've got some areas where you have uh, high suitability at next door to unsuitable. Yeah. How do you fare that edge? Because I know there's a term that you need to quickly play. You've got a lot of different habitats and issues in there. How do you fare that edge? Well, if you were looking at um, those sort of issues at a fine scale, you'd probably be best to run the stand level system and create a prescription at that edge and say that some part rely on the local forester to pick up that differentiation at planting, for example. So, yeah, you lose the spatial. Yeah, I know, because I mean, the, I know that the ESC is based on uh, gentaxity data for the soil and that's a point. Uh, yeah, well, that's why we're trying to move towards people uploading a soil survey. I mean, it really, really, ES can't work with that data that you mentioned, you know, that at a strategic scale perhaps, but not, not at site level planning. Thanks. <laughs>